Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, January 8th, 2019. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brains. Now, this is a busy week for astronomy news. We have currently going on in Seattle, Washington, the 233rd meeting of the American Astronomical Society. This is one of the largest meetings of astronomers that takes place in the entire world, and it attracts astronomers from many different nations who come to present their latest research, to recruit new students, to hire new postdocs. Now, unfortunately, one thing that isn't happening this week is the presentation of a whole lot of different NASA results. Where possible, we do have people who are either on grants or are government contractors who still have funding allocations remaining. They're presenting the results for their colleagues. But unfortunately, due to the U.S. government shutdown, all that science has been silenced. According to the Office of Management and Budgets, astronomers can't even volunteer their time to trying to do this work that many of them have chosen to do, not for the money, but for the love. So as people don't receive their paychecks this week, let's think of all the different things that are going silent. Now, luckily, there are many other scientists out there who are still funded, who are still able to keep doing what they can do up until it comes time for their grants to renew. So let's celebrate that science while we can. So in today's first story, we have a tale of galaxies gone missing. Well, not so much missing as unnoticed. Galaxy clusters are really hard to find. These are gravitationally bound collections of, well, galaxies. And it turns out that the majority of the mass in these systems is not in things we can see, especially not in things that we can see with optical telescopes. Only a couple of percent of the mass in the entire system is part of those galaxies, the galaxy clusters, the galaxies in the galaxy clusters that we go looking for with our optical telescopes. There's another roughly 4% of the mass in the system that is bound up in intercluster gas that glows brightly in X-ray wavelengths. And there's another 90% of the mass. That is all dark matter. Trying to find these systems up until now has been done largely in two different ways. Either astronomers, and this is work I did as part of my dissertation, astronomers do surveys of the sky, looking at galaxies above the plane of the Milky Way, hoping that that one luminous galaxy we know is out there has a bunch of friends around it. We count up those galaxies around it. We look to see, is there an overdensity? Is this something that appears to be, well, denser than that neighboring part of space? And if it appears that way, we go and we request time on telescopes that have instruments called spectrographs attached that allow us to measure the distances to all these different galaxies using Doppler shifts. And we look to see if this is a gravitationally bound together system where all the galaxies are at roughly the same redshift, but have offsets due to their motions within the cluster. Now, that is the way that these things were found for a whole lot of years. Then along came the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and it's been finding galaxy clusters by simply, well, measuring the specter of just about everything on the sky. Now, in between these two different techniques are people who have done other, well, galaxy redshift surveys. In fact, one of the surveys, and here I have to look to get the name right, it's the 2D FGRS survey. This is a survey that took place in the late 90s, the early 2000s, and it looked at 191,000 440 galaxies. It was conducted with the 3.9 meter Anglo-Australian Observatory. And um, this particular team 
they looked at a much wider area on the sky, looking at the nearby universe. So a wider area than Sloan, looking at the nearby universe, so things that are large and look clearly like galaxies. And they measured the redshift of all these different systems. And now astronomers are going through using a technique called data mining. You look up data that's been published and you look for science in that data that no one has done before. And by data mining the 2D FGRS survey, they have been able to start finding more and more galaxy clusters that, well, had never gone noticed before. As they find these new systems in the nearby universe, they project that roughly one third of all galaxy clusters are out there just not being noticed, blending into the background quite literally as we fail to include them in our science. It's kind of amazing to think that some of the most massive structures in the universe are still so small in the vastness of the sky, are still so, well, empty, that we're just not noticing them. But that's the way it appears to be. This is a cool piece of science, and I look forward to seeing more and more results coming from it. And this is just another reminder that old photons captured on old telescopes can still be used to do new science. Now, in other results, we have research done by graduate student Lea Madreas, who is working to try and put together computational models of how material flows in and around supermassive black holes of a variety of different geometries and physical parameters. Through his catalog of four different papers, he is documenting exactly what we should expect to see as we, well, get better and better at observing supermassive black holes in nearby galaxies. This research is the kind of stuff that we do ahead of the observations so that we can figure out, does our universe actually match our theories? Now, this is going to allow us to see, were the predictions of relativity actually, well, completely relevant to black holes? Or are there things out there that we're missing, details that we don't yet understand and that we have to figure out and factor in to understand the universe that we actually see? This is a tremendous amount of computing that went into this research, and it also produced some of the most beautiful images that I have recently seen coming out of theoretical models. This is just a cool result. We are still waiting for a link to the paper, um, but I just want to read you a quote from the researcher. Again, this is graduate student Lea Matreos, who says, we want to test whether black holes we observe in space behave the way we expect. If we detected a deviation from our expectations, we may fundamentally change the way we think about black holes and gravity itself. Now, on the other side of this, if there are no deviations, that gives us a somewhat even more exciting result, to me at least, because it says we got it right. Now, those are the two stories I wanted to start with. And next up, we're going to be bringing to you live a uh, press conference coming to us from the American Astronomical Society meeting in Seattle, Washington. I will be here to answer your questions in real time. And if there's questions I can't answer and the chat gets working again, the chat for the press currently isn't functioning. Um, if we can get everything working, um, I will relay on questions as I can. Now, until then, um, I will answer what questions I can for you. Um, while you type this in, and I'm going to remind you to please at CosmicQuestX in the chat so I can find your questions better. Um, we have a Patreon set up to help us support this channel and everything else that we do over at CosmoQuest. There are some cool rewards, including a Discord channel that is just for subscribers. And um, this is a way that you can help provide us a regular, well, income that we can count on to pay for this show and the other activities that we do here at CosmoQuest. Your donations put in in the final hours, days, weeks of 2018, they're why we're still here. We suffered a rather horrible 
grant cut going into the new year. And you are the reason that we're still here today. Now, with our Patreon, we offer you a cool group of rewards if you follow us there. And um, I will be sending you once a week an update on everything that we have going on, as well as the other rewards, which you can check out over at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. So, um, any other questions out there in the chat? Um, and I'm going to begin switching over to our new stuff soon. So Noel is asking, how soon will the CosmoQuest site be working again? Um, we're working on it. Skinning things is always the hardest part. And we're currently dealing with that. The last 5% takes, well, more than 5% of the time. So I'm not going to make an estimate. I'm hoping to get more parts of the site turned on today, but we're not going to give you anything until it is ready. So thank you for your patience. Um, other questions out there? No, Noel, we are not the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, in fact, most things are working. The biggest thing that is holding us up, to be entirely honest, is with the change of funding and the change of institutes. We're having to go through all our existing content page by page, making sure we've updated all of the terms of service, all of the political language, all those things so that we don't get ourselves in trouble. Um, and that was something that we hadn't really factored in when we were planning to relaunch the site. So yeah, we're going through and doing that. Um, so Veronica is asking, from the conference yesterday, how do they know the temperature of faraway planets? Uh, we look to see, in a lot of ways, um, what what is the amount of light being reflected from the world in a variety of different colors? This is called the black body radiation. The color of light where the most light comes off of the planet, that generally corresponds to the temperature of the planet. Now, it also, of course, is correlated with the star's color, so we have to deconvolve all of that. But it, it all comes down to what is the temperature. Um, okay, so as we're running out of time for this, and it starts to be time for the press conference, I am going to go ahead and switch scenes so please bear with me for one moment while we change our setup things may go slightly picasso for the moment Okay, I think that we are back. Um, I'm not quite sure where the chat went. Hopefully it will return as well. Um, the press conference should be starting here. Thank you so much for the bits, Veronica. Um, it's not quite streaming yet, I don't think. I pressed play. I'm not sure what it's doing. I will continue to refresh periodically as needed. So Hanny is asking, is there any other temperature where geology can take place? Since we know of Earth temperature and Pluto temperature works, could there be hotter that could work? Um, so geology can happily work at much hotter temperatures. Venus is a great example of that. Uh, exactly how hot? Well, when you melt your world, geology stops. So basically between those temperatures where you have solid surfaces, pick your surface content, and uh, those temperatures where everything is liquid and those temperatures where everything is solid. So between all solid and all liquid, that is where geology is. And because of the range and compositions of planets, you can end up with a whole lot of 
different temperatures depending on if you have a metal world, a, a icy world, um, or exactly what. Okay, progress is being made. Now I'm going to zoom in on this bit by bit and do some screen capturing because um, yesterday we had a black bar issue that I brought up and I'm going to be working on trying very hard to uh, document that black bar for the people at the AAS in hopes that we can maybe work with them to get their layout fixed. Standby live web webcast will begin soon. Okay, so we have no black bar at this size. Let's screen capture that. Now, here we go. So um, yesterday we had two briefings that both touched on exoplanets. Today, another briefing that's mostly about planets and exoplanets and how they form and the stars that they form around. Um, the reason for that is because uh, this meeting had uh, more exoplanet papers than any meeting we've had before. And in fact, I think we ended up having to schedule three parallel exoplanet world sessions at the same time in order to squeeze them all in. Uh, so, which is kind of frustrating for the exoplanet folks because they might want to be in more than one place at a time. So, um, today we're going to talk about formation um, and some of the mysteries of, of how planets form around stars. Uh, you can get insight into that by looking at the stars themselves or at the planets themselves. So, we're going to have four presentations that touch on um, both of those aspects. Uh, as usual, uh, I will introduce the four panelists, and then they'll speak in order, and then we'll, we'll, so you'll hold your questions, and then we'll have the Q&A at the end. All right, so um, today's presentations are going to go from here to there. Uh, we're going to start with Carol Brady from Eureka Scientific, talking about the eroding disk of the young M star, AU microscopium. Then uh, she'll be followed by Elizabeth Bailey at Caltech talking about the hot Jupiter period mass distribution as a signature of in-situ formation. Then Aparna Bhattacharya from NASA Goddard will speak on exoplanet masses challenging the core accretion theory of planet formation. And then finally David Bennett, also of NASA Goddard, microlensing challenges the core accretion runaway growth scenario for gas giants. So Aparna and David are colleagues and their presentations are somewhat coordinated. All right, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Carol. Now, Carol's asked to do her presentation sitting down, so I'm going to swap our HDMI cable. And we're going to lock everything to work. Hello. Um, those of you who are over in the extreme end of the session, I'm sorry about the occultation. <laughs> but, um, now, this is uh, the result of uh, a continuing program that we have had using both Hubble and uh, the VLT's uh, sphere instrument. I'm going to be talking about the Hubble portion of it. And the first thing is AUMIC is a red dwarf. It's fairly nearby. Uh, at under 32 light years. It's actually unusual in that we know its age very well. It is a member of the Beta Pictoris moving group, and as a result, uh, people can use, uh, can construct an HR diagram and use guilt by association uh, to uh, uh, figure out the age of the system. So it's about 24 million years old. Uh, it is some, a star which uh, has a, a, an activity cycle. Uh, five years has been claimed for it. It's, it's, it's very active. And it has a circumstellar disk. The disk is viewed edge on, which means you can see features which extend above the disk. 
And it also has a planet. Um, this is work by Peter Plavchen um, that he reported first a couple years ago and then um, has confirmed with test data. So it's got a uh, presumably a Jovian mass planet in a one month period. Now, what we've done is use uh, coronagraphic imaging. So we basically put a fist over the star and it's exactly like walking down the beach at sunset when you're trying to see, is that your friend who's got the ice cream machine on her? And so you just stick your hand out, you block the light and uh, you pr you contrast. So we've been using the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. The first three of these are from 2010, 2011, 2017, and 2018, um, this last summer. We used a different uh, coronagraphic aperture for the last observation, so um, the field of view changes. Now what uh, if you have, um, mm -hmm. I don't know why it didn't let me do that. Okay, uh, if you notice, um, there are these little lumps on in the um, arm on the left, which don't stay in the same place. In fact, they are moving outward um, systematically. The um, and you can see this motion on time scales as short as eight to nine months. So um, we've been tracking these for a number of years. This was called to our attention by our sphere colleagues. They used Davic as a commissioning target and um, they saw all the same features but found that um, they weren't at the same place. So this was something of a surprise for them. Um, what we've done more recently is we've combined uh, ALMA data, um, which has provided a mass estimate for the disk, including larger bodies than just submillimeter sized grains um, using the scale height of the disk to get there. Uh, the mass estimate for per, for per feature and uh, the number of features with proper motions, in other words, motions on the plane of the sky, indicated that they are escaping. And um, this appears to be about three per, uh, per decade, but that could be uncertain by one to two. Yeah. And what we find is uh, the disk, the remaining disk lifetime is estimated to be about 1.4 million years. And when I did this last summer, my initial reaction was, so um, I hadn't expected that. And the reason I hadn't expected that was we've been imaging disks around other stars. We've got a couple G stars of 2.3 giga year. And then there's always our system, which has debris belts, uh, which are still going strong. Um, we had lovely photos over the last week of, of um, Ultima Thule, which is one of the planetesimals in our Kuiper belt, um, provided by New Horizons. Um, now, the other thing that we, I should estimate, this is still a work in progress. We do not know the mechanism responsible for ejecting these things. Thus far, we have a large number of mechanisms which have died very, variously messy deaths. Um, and uh, we're hoping, hoping, hoping uh, that being able to track features like this one um, and look at how its aspect ratio changes over time uh, may give us some insight. The size of these things is commensurate with the size of coronal mass ejections in our outer system. So these are big structures. And, um, in a case, and we have a couple other early M stars where we think we're looking at the same phenomenon. Um, uh, we 
which have the distinctive feature that the outer portions of their disks look like Swiss cheeses. So, uh, our, the disk lifetime estimate that, that we have that uh, shows going to be basically over, certainly by 30 million years, um, is consistent with estimates for a, a deficit in Amistar debris disks after about 30 million years. Um, it's m totally different from what we've seen around A stars, where we've been able to image disks uh, out to essentially the terminal A to B sequence of a star, uh, or G stars, where again, we can do it indefinitely and we live in a two belt system. Um, what this suggests is that processes which depend on disk survival may be inhibited in systems around young M stars. Uh, and this includes the uh, delivery of water and organics to terrestrial mass planets in the habitable zone. So we would predict that in fact um, we're not going to see much evidence for uh, water or organics except in the population of systems which started out more massive and have uh, stained down in the radiation environment of the star. So um, there's been a lot of interest in looking at M star planets. Um, they're easy to find. There's a bunch of them which are nearby, etc. They may not be like the young Earth. They may not be even like the old Earth. So, um, so just a, ca a caveat. We may have found the limit to habitable planets. So, um, the uh, we are also pursuing this system. study of the star that will be, there's a poster on that by Kowalski and out tomorrow. And um, this is just a, a work in progress and we hope to be able to keep this going. Hints to future PAC members, we need telescopes to take it from here. Uh, astronomers tend to like projects with telescopes and things. Um, and the problem is what we have, we're finding is phenomena which take longer to occur. So. Okay, thank you very much. You can come up, please. My name is Elizabeth Bailey, and I am a PhD candidate at Caltech. And I'm going to be discussing some new evidence that we found um, that suggests that hot Jupiters actually formed close to their stars. So when hot Jupiters were first discovered in the 90s, it was a huge surprise to astronomers because up until that point, the only example uh, that anybody really had to work off of to understand planet formation was our own solar system. And um, in the solar system, I mean, there's really nothing orbiting interior to Mercury, not even a belt of asteroids. So for there to be giant planets, not only well within the snow lines of their stars, but also well within the orbital distance of Mercury, um, presented a major challenge to the existing understanding of planet formation. And so uh, in response to this discovery, um, there were a lot of uh, scenarios put forth um, as potential ways that hot Jupiters could actually start out by forming um, uh, like a several AU distances from their stars, similar to uh, our own giant planets, and then migrate all the way in. And this uh, 
is still the dominant paradigm for um, what people think is the way that hot Jupiters form. Uh, but in recent years, there has been a uh, sort of an another possibility which has been gaining some traction in the literature, which is that of in situ formation, where the hot Jupiter actually just forms close in. Um, and so that is what we address in this work. Uh, so here's a plot showing observed exoplanets, the, the semi-major axis in mass in log-log space. And uh, you can see those two clumps in the upper part of the uh, graph are the hot Jupiters and the cold Jupiters. And uh, I've shown our, our Jupiter on the plot too as the yellow mark. Um, our Jupiter is actually a so-called cold Jupiter uh, in the framework of exoplanets. Um, and you'll notice on this plot that there is a um, region that isn't really populated with new planets, and it's called the desert uh, in the literature. Um, and the question is, what sets the boundary of the hot Jupiters with this desert? You'll notice that this inner boundary of the hot Jupiters is actually pretty sharp looking. And generally, um, when it comes to planets or asteroids, um, when things scatter from their original uh, formation location, there, it tends to create a scattered appearance of their distribution. So that seemed like a clue that this sharp inner boundary of the hot Jupiter uh, distribution might actually uh, be a signature of their formation close to their stars. Um, so taking this um, and, and um, seeing if we can test this hypothesis, we uh, devise a rough, uh, simple model for how we might expect hot Jupiter formation to play out in the inner regions of protoplanetary disks. So what we took into account in our model um, is that the disk, protoplanetary disks are accreting onto their stars, and we uh, assume that that accretion is supplying the hot Jupiter with material. And additionally, we um, make the uh, point that there is an innermost radius of the disk where we would expect planet formation to be an active process because stars tend to carve out holes in the middle of their disks. And we take that, the radius of that uh, magnetospheric uh, cavity to be the innermost place where we would expect the hot Jupiter to form. So taking these assumptions into account, we uh, predicted we predicted a, uh, a expression for the inner boundary of the hot Jupiter population, which actually agrees quite well with the observations, uh, as you can see in this plot. Um, so overall, if, if our interpretation is correct, what this appears to suggest is that uh, hot Jupiters actually in most cases form close to their stars rather than forming far away uh, like S Jupiter and Saturn. And if that is correct, then it would mean that hot Jupiters are distinct in their origins from Jupiter and Saturn and other so-called cold Jupiters. And uh, our work is published in AppJ Letters. Uh, if you want to check that out. Thanks. I'm a postdoc at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and University of Maryland College Park. And I'm going to talk about the cool exoplanets discovered by Michael Lansing. Um, and also this talk is going to continue to the next talk. So 
first, I would like to um, introduce like what exactly is microlensing. So for that, let's say this is our source that's in the galactic center, and I'm going to shine at Mariella. <laughs> so she is our Keck telescope, and this is our um, this ball here is our lens system that is in the galactic disk. So it has some strange star spots, but just ignore it. It's fine. <laughs> So this is in our galactic disk. So as the star is moving and coming in front of the source star, the light from the source star gets gravitationally bent by the mass and the gravity of this, of this star. And as a result, what we see is a very magnified brightness of the source star. Also, if it happens that this star um, if the star happens to host a planet, then as this planet comes in front of the source star, then the light from the source star gets bent by the um, gravitation field of the planet. And as a result, as you see, we can see a planetary anomaly over there. And hence, so this whole system, this lens actually works like a nature's own magnifying glass. And as you see, this is how it really looks in the real daytime. Now, this is one particular event that I would focus on today in my talk, is this OGO 2012 Bulge 950, where um, this event was in 2012 it happened, and it, as you see in the boxes that are in the bottom, that these dips show the detection of the, uh, the detection of the planet. But even though this happened in 2012, we decided to uh, follow up this event with high resolution two telescopes, Hubble Space Telescope and Keck Laser Guide Star Adaptive Optics on May 23rd, 2018, simultaneously. And why we decided to do that was because during the event that, um, as I showed, when this is the situation, the light from the source is actually very magnified and we are not able to see this lens system actually. So we cannot actually see the host star and, and the planet, but in spite of that, we can still detect the planet. So during the event, as you see, the lens is very faint. And as few months later and even few years later, five to six years later, this, um, this whole thing has moved away and then the source brightness has come back to normal, and what we see is basically elongated source and lens. So we don't see them resolved, but we still see them elongated. And if we observe a decade later, then we will see them totally separated. So this is the time when we, five to six years later, that's when we took the observation. And what we saw from Keck image is that the lens and the source are elongated, and we were able to detect the lens and source, and we were able to measure the separation between them, which was 34 milliard second. Now, how small is this 34 milliard second? It's literally like locating a dime from 110 kilometer or 68 miles away. So you're, um, so I'm over here holding this dime and you're on top of Mount Rainier and you're able to locate this dime from Mount Rainier to here. So that's how small it is. And that is a really difficult thing to do. So for that, we really had to understand the Keck images very well. So once we have got that, we can actually um, get the mass measurement of the exoplanet. And what we got is it's a 39 Earth mass planet. So we have no planet like this kind of planet in our solar system because Neptune is like 17 Earth mass and then Saturn is like 95 Earth mass. And this is a really um, cold planet that is um, between Saturn and Neptune. And this is very important because the leading planet formation theory, core accretion actually predicts that these kind of planets should be rare. But the question is, is that is this kind of planet really uncommon, really rare, or is it like the theory is built so that like it can kind of support the solar system model, and maybe our solar system is sort of biased, maybe or unique. So um, because of that, it's a really interesting observation, and um, Dave is going to follow more on this. 
but just to end my presentation, that W first, which will fly in mid 2020s, will use this method to measure mass of hundreds of such exoplanets and reveal many exciting signs. My poster is at 247.09. Please check it out. And if you have any questions, you have my contact. Yeah, just contact me. <laughs> Okay, um, hi, my name is David Bennett, uh, as Aparna mentioned. Um, I'm located at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and I also work for the University of Maryland. Uh, I'm presenting uh, results based on a paper that's actually presented uh, by a colleague, um, Daisuke Suzuki. He's in the back row. Um, raise your hand, Daisuke. Um, so, uh, and uh, his presentation is going to be in the uh, W first uh, special session on uh, recent results from from microlensing as a pathfinder for W first. Okay, so uh, first I wanted to say a few words about planet formation theory. Um, planet formation theory is pretty important, even if you're only interested in habitable planets, because um, it's not just enough to have a planet in the habitable zone. It has to you have to have chemicals that are. Um, you know, are, are consistent with life and, and a history that's um, consistent with the development of life. Um, and so the better we can understand planet formation, the better are we are able to predict which planets might be habitable. Okay, um, I started my career as a cosmologist, and I must say that planet formation theory is very, very much harder than cosmology theory. In cosmology, theorists can do, uh, uh, you know, a, a straightforward prediction, and observers can go out and check it and determine whether it's true or false. And um, planet formation theory is much more difficult, and, and such clean tests are, 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 are not so easy. Okay, um, the, the leading theory of planet formation is the core accretion theory, and it's originally based on the solar system. And one of the key um, aspects of uh, uh, core accretion theory is uh, this concept of the snow line. And this, this plot shows a diagram of a protoplanetary disk, and the temperature of that disk changes um, very in very close to the star. There's a lot of s uh, stellar heating, and so the gas and uh, material in the disk is very hot. And, and, and it's too hot to, um, to form ice. Uh, water would be in vapor form. But as you move out in our solar system at, at 2.7 AU, we expect that the disk was cool enough so that ice would condense. And this means that there's more solid material available for, for planets to form. And the implication, according to the core accretion theory, is this is where Jupiter formed, and, and the giant planets in our solar system are all located now beyond the snow line. Okay, and if we look at um, you know the, the planets w that we know have already been discovered, this plot shows them as a function of their mass and their separation. But the separation is given in units of this snow line, and so you see the vast majority of planets are found by the transit method. Um, primarily by Kepler, and now we're getting many more by, by TESS. There's also many um, short period planets found by radio velocity, and some long period planets as well. But it's only microlensing that can um, really study the longer period planets beyond the snow line at a range of masses, going from super Jupiters down to um, sub-Neptunes. And if there were Earths there, we should be able to see them as well. Okay, so um, at present, the, the sort of state of the art study of statistical study of, of planet properties um, from microlensing is um, this MOA-2 survey result, also led by uh, Dr. Suzuki. And here um, I show a plot of um, the planets, that, that are the 30 planets from this uh, study, um, plotted as a function of their mass ratio. That's the black histogram at the bottom. 
And you see that um, as far as planet discoveries go, uh, the distribution is pretty flat in, in mass ratio. However, the, the planets, um, super Jupiter planets, are much easier to detect than, than Neptunes or sub-Neptunes. And so um, to get the real occurrence rate, we have to correct for this detection efficiency. And we do that, then we see um, the red curve. And, and that indicates that um, the Neptunes and sub-Neptunes are much more common and probably the most common types of planets out beyond the snow line. Okay, now to co compare this to theory, um, it's a little complicated. We, we compare to a type of theory referred to as population synthesis models. Okay, and, but the planet formation uh, process is so complicated that um, these population synthesis models have to use um, you know, approximations for m multiple different very complicated physical processes that um, can sometimes be you know, calculated in detail, but, but to, to simulate a, a large population of planets to compare with, uh, with observations requires this type of simulation. And um, as Elizabeth er alluded to earlier in, in her presentation, um, a key question in, in this planet formation is planetary migration. And um, it's not really understood very well. It was once thought that it would be very important. Now some people are arguing that it's not so important. And, um, and so the, uh, the two groups that have done population synthesis calculations with us um, have done calculations with their standard migration and also turning migration off. And as you can see at, at the giant planet side, um, it looks like um, you know, turning, turning man, uh, migration off or down very much probably helps to fit the number of giant planets that we see. Um, but it doesn't help at all with these intermediate mass planets. And, um, and, and so in all cases, the, the two different um, population synthesis codes and with and without migration are failing to produce these, um, th this number of uh, sub-Saturn uh, mass planets. And um, so this kind of um, answers the question that Aparna asked, that these, um, you know, it's not an accident that this Ogle um, 2012 950 event um, w w was, you know, found to have a, a 40 or 39 Earth mass planet. Um, actually, those, those are fairly common. They're more ca common than Saturn's or, or Jupiter's. Um, and so the lack of such planets in our own solar system is more likely to do be to be due to random chance or an accident, um, and it's not actually a sign of the theory. Uh, I mean, and so, you know, the, the fact that the core accretion theory predicts something that looks like the solar system is pro is just more likely a coincidence than um, than actual success. Okay, and to explain why it is that um, that you know, the core accretion theory has been predicting this gap. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this runaway accretion um, process. And so um, this diagram the on, the, on the right shows, um, you know, the traditional core accretion model for gi giant planet formation. Initially, um, you get a, um, a, ten, a ten r roughly 10 Earth mass core um, that begins to slowly accrete hydrogen and helium gas. And then uh, once uh, the amount of gas equals the, the, the core size, then um, the accretion goes through this runaway accretion process and you accumulate mass very quickly. Okay, so you want to think about how, um, how this might finish. So one possibility is that, um, that radiation from a star or from a nearby star might drive the gas out of the system um, during that few million years of the, uh, of the slow accretion. And if that happens, what you end up with is something like a Neptune. And we see those are quite common, so maybe that happens a lot. Um, and, but then according to this, the uh, uh, other likely thing is, is that um, the gas would leave the system after something like a Jupiter has formed. Okay, but the odds that um, it would stop just in the middle of this very rapid accretion process s would seem to be very low. And that's the basic reason um, for, for this gap or, or desert in, in the distribution of, uh, of cold planets that, that um, was predicted by uh, you know, early versions of core accretion. Now, um, uh, so but people are getting doing more sophisticated calculations, and in particular, the original calculations were just spherically symmetric uh, collapse in basically one dimension. And so now they're doing um, complicated hydrodynamic simulations in three dimensions, and 
this video shows the uh, final result of, of, of one of these calculations or, or a result in, in image. This is a, a protoplanetary disk being simulated. They were just um, rotating it around to show what it looks like. And in that sort of blue region, there's a planet. And when we look at the cutaway, we can see where the planet's forming. And, um, and so basically, um, th you see that the, the accretion is sort of going through this uh, protoplanetary disk or sorry, pro, um, circumplanetary disk, and, and in fact, we expect that such things have to be there because it explains the formation of uh, planet, the, r the moon systems around um, Jupiter and Saturn. Okay, so um, th the the video that I've used here um, is from uh, Judith Silazi in, uh, from Zurich, and her simulations actually don't in don't have this. Um, runaway accretion process. Now, the, the difficulty is that it, it's very computationally expensive to do these calculations, and, um, and so this calculation that she showed, it took her three months to do, and so it's hard to, to probe all the different um, possible parameters. Um, and so not everyone is convinced that this is um, the solution to this problem, but, but it's, it's clear that um, you know, planet formation theory kind of needs all the help it can get from, from observations. And so um, this is the motivation then for the, um, the uh, exoplanet survey, uh, exoplanet microlensing survey of the WFIRST mission. Um, I'm showing here a plot from a simulation by Matthew Penny um, comparing uh, planets discovered by Kepler to predicted planets covered by, discovered by WFIRST. And you can see that um, we're able, with, with a combination of these, these methods, we're able to discover planets down to well below Earth mass at all separations. Um, and in fact, microlensing is possible to detect even free-floating planets um, out at infinite separations. So it really is that we're sampling uh, the planetary distribution um, f at separations from zero to infinity. Okay, um, so as I said, the, um, the, the, the talk on this is going to be given by Desuke at the uh, special session on W First uh, this afternoon. So, thank you. All right, thank you all very much. So, we're going to start uh, by taking questions here in the room. Um, Christine Pulliam from the Space Telescope Science Institute has the roving mic. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. Wait for the mic, and when you get it, please identify yourself and your affiliation. So we'll start down here with uh, Clara. And then again, if you're on the webcast, please queue up your questions via the text chat, and Carrie will relate them to us. Hi, um, I'll start with a question about the moon. Uh, what, what is it about N stars that you think might make them unique in having these disappearing disks? Well, uh, M stars are extremely active. Um, the, I mean, they have periods of quiescence, but um, in our week of XMM observations, we got a lot of flares, big flares, little flares, yes. Um, and uh, so they are not nearly as quiescent, and they keep this up for at least the first giga year. And... Uh, the other thing is, if you're going to go by habitable zone calculations, your habitable zone is almost down at the co-rotation radius, about 0.08 AU. So you're parking your planets that you think might uh, be suitable places to be in the temperature range to support liquid water in probably the least benign radiation environment. So it's, it's a combination of uh, effects that um, basically can strip atmospheres from planets um, and uh, make life much more challenging for life. Thank you. I think I forgot to say uh, Clara Moskowitz with Scientific American. Uh, can I add one more right. question <coughs> for Elizabeth Bailey? Um, can you kind of clarify what makes it so surprising that the hot Jupiters would form in situ rather than further out. I think it has to do with the snow line, but um, if you could talk more about that. I'd say the most surprising aspect of that is um, for so many years, the only example we had was our solar system. And at the distances where hot Jupiters are found from their stars, in our own solar system, there's 
like literally nothing there. So it's a big difference between nothing and giant planet. Um, and that was a surprise. Okay, we'll take uh, Alan first and then come back over to this side of the room. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Alan Boyle with uh, GeekWire. I wanted to follow up on what Clara was asking uh, for Dr. Grady. I think that you said that uh, the mechanism maybe isn't known and that uh, some of your hypotheses uh, died messy deaths, but it sounds as if that idea of active stars is kind of the, the suspect that you're focusing in on? Well, it's where we've got our current set of hopes. Uh, but uh, it's uh, when you're starting to talk about phenomena on orbital timescales of giant planets, you're typically talking long duration phenomena. And it has been very difficult to persuade observatories to cough up the observing time uh, to be commensurate with that. So it's still a work in progress. Okay, I think, Ethan, you had a question? All right, so I, I actually have two questions, but the first yourself. one is either for Aparna or David, and I don't care which of you takes it. Um, and that is, um, you know, you talked about that we have these models of like the, uh, sorry, the, uh, the runaway gas accretion model, the core accretion model of the solar system. And if we make these sort of naive assumptions about how it works, uh, that you would expect sort of this, uh, this bimodal distribution, and we actually don't see a bimodal distribution. We see actually there's, you know, there's plenty in between Neptune mass and Saturn mass. Um, is there a takeaway that's anything more substantial than this naive model is too naive? Um, well, I, I wouldn't say it's exactly a, a naive model. It's, um, I mean, the the core accretion theory actually has sort of multiple complicated physical processes that aren't completely understood, and they're believed because we see planets. Um, and so, you know, this is one process that's, that was considered to be part of the core accretion theory, and um, and so we think it's you know it's unlikely to um, to work the way that it, it was originally thought. Um, but, uh, you know, most of the practitioners, um, in, in planet formation theory think that, um, you know, it's basically that this is something that needs to be fixed in core accretion theory. There's, um, you know, another issue that they've been debating is, is the amount of migration there is, right? And, and it had been thought that, um, migration was really needed to explain these hot Jupiters. But, you know, as we saw from Elizabeth, um, that's no longer um, so much the case. And, uh, and so, um, you know, basically, y you know, with microlensing, we're sort of taking the first look at um, the formation of planets um, or, or the, the, the distribution of planets in, in orbits like the ones in our own solar system. And, um, and so we see that the, the core accretion model in this runaway gas accretion process is not really adequately describing them. So um, the thing is that the theory is so hard, it's not like there's an alternate theory that kind of explains the same thing. There is an alternate theory um, called uh, gravitational instability, and um, there's a reasonable chance that it plays some role in planet formation, but it seems unlikely that it's going to um, supplant the core accretion theory. There may be some mixture. I mean, doesn't, of doesn't Saturn not have a sufficiently large core to even cause this scenario, as far as we know? Um, I think Saturn actually is thought to have um, a pretty large core. Um, there's some more debate, I think, about the mass of the core in, uh, in Jupiter. But, um, but a lot of this involves, um, you know, sort of understanding equations of state at very high pressures that um, are very hard to produce on Earth. Uh, can I ask a second question? Only if you identify yourself. Uh, sorry. 
Uh, I'm Ethan Siegel. I write Starts With a Bang, currently hosted on Forbes. Uh, and my second question is for Elizabeth. Um, you know, you talk about how uh, planets actually form. And as I understand it, you know, based on our solar system, the leading theory is that actually we probably did form a large world in the inner portion of our solar system early on, and it was swallowed by the sun. And that's why we only have these tiny things inside, even though we're orbiting a relatively large star. Um, and so I, I, had, I had understood that that was the leading theory that was a part of like the Grand Track model and things like that. Why is it such a surprise that we would form large planets in situ also? Um. So I think uh, the the theory you're talking about isn't referring to like a single like giant planet uh, falling into the star, but more like super Earth maybe. Um, That's fair. Yeah. So um, what was your question again? So why is it a surprise that you would form large planets around there if they stick around and don't get swallowed? If they stick around and don't get swallowed? Yeah. Well. It's not really a surprise to me, but it's a surprise to the field. Form there because it's too hot. The gas would boil off. Right. So what what is enabling the gas? to stay there. I mean, how can we have a Jupiter as opposed to just a big old, you know, giant rock? So so one major um, uh, s sort of factor that people um, thought meant that there could not be uh, hot Jupiters forming in place um, close in was um, that it was assumed that there were not suitable cores of available. Um, and that was largely due to the lack of stuff orbiting close in in our own solar system. I mean, to uh, to undergo core accretion, you need to have a core that's like 10 Earth masses-ish. Um, and so we don't have anything like that in our own solar system. And in fact, interior to the approximate snow line, um, we just have little terrestrial planets that are quite puny and not suitable. Like the Earth would not be big enough to to undergo core accretion. Um, so actually, then it became gradually known through observations of exoplanets that super Earths are pretty common close in. Um, and, and that actually, um, there's, they're actually so common that only like 1% of them would need to undergo uh, core accretion to uh, runaway accretion to become, to account for the entire hot Jupiter population. I can actually add something to that. Um, so there, there was a, um, a thing called the minimum mass solar nebula, which people figured out based on, you know, looking at what's the, the planets in our solar system, what's the minimum mass nebula that could account for that. And a lot of the planet formation th theory early on was developed relating to this minimum mass solar nebula. And with that, there's not really enough material to make a core for the giant planet. Yes, the minimum mass solar nebula is essentially an approximation that people used before they really knew what to do because there weren't really observations to work from. So they essentially said, let's take the mass of all the planets and kind of spread them out and say that that was the initial disk uh, material available for planet formation and that um, a forming planet would have kind of an annulus of mass and that would be what it would have to form from. Um, and because we don't, I mean, our, it, it has become uh, known through exoplanet observations that our own solar system's architecture is not characteristic of uh, other systems. Okay, I'm, uh, we'll come back over to this side, Steve Marin first, then we'll go to Martin, then we'll come back over here. Actually, Les Leslie had one, right? Okay. Terry, do we have any online? So, uh, my question for Dr. Bailey was answered just now. For Dr. Grady, uh, if I understood correctly, you've concluded that it's unlikely for planets big enough to, at least from the aspect of size and mass, to be habitable to form around an M dwarf 
in the habitable zone. I think I understood you to say that. Well, what we've, what we've found is that if you look at the data for AUMIC, it says there probably was time to produce small planets close in. Um, but the process that seems to be missing Um, by being basically pelted by asteroidal material, by being pelted by okay. cometary material. That was not material. my question. It was so my we think understanding of what you said. You know, we think that the small planets form, but if you look at them, if you look at, and you have to look at them at a range of ages, um, what you're going to, I think, find is that they, d uh, they don't um, have a clear presence of water at 150 million years, as in the case of the Earth, and they don't have uh, surviving atmospheres in the older systems. Okay, that does answer. Martin. <coughs> uh, Martin Ratcliffe for Freelance and Skyscan. Um, I think this may be a question for David, but I'm not sure. Um, I didn't know runaway gas accretion was a thing, and I think I <laughs> missed part of the explanation, but um, my idea of a gas accretion disk is predominantly hydrogen and helium plus a few little others. So how, how do you get in, in essentially a hot disk unless you're out in the cold disk? Um, what, what is the mechanism that triggers this runaway accretion? I presumably cold gas. Um, I miss something here? Yeah, well, I mean, it is out in the, you know, out beyond the snow line, and, um, you know, the, the thought was, I mean, the one-dimensional calculation, um, you know, hydrodynamical calculation, um, you know, indicates that, that once, um, once the, the gas mass gets to be equal to, um, to the uh, core mass, that, um, you know, the increasing pressure at the bottom of, of the gas distribution then, um, you know, builds higher density that then um, can attract more gas quickly. And it's, you know, it's important that the gas has to be able to cool, but um, um, so it is, you know, it's a somewhat complicated process when you do it. And, and, you know, to do it properly, you have to include the angular momentum and, uh, and realistic uh, radiation transport, which wasn't done um, initially. Um, but it, it has been thought that this is, you know, the main reason why there aren't any these, you know, I mean, th this has been used to predict this, uh, this mass gap. Um, okay. I think I can, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I can maybe just say a little bit simple is like, so beyond the snow line, it's ice, it's solid enough that they can just stick together, start forming a core, and once the core gets really big, it starts attracting all the gas together and once one planet becomes like one core becomes really big and starts attracting all the gas and all the gas just forms you know one big giant planet so it just becomes either like a small planet or it just becomes a giant planet like saturn jupiter like that so that's how they explain or they're tr the theory is trying to explain so that's why we don't have this 20 to 80 Yes, this gap because there's how is this intermediate? How is this stopping? This gas accretion is stopping. So it's like that. Okay, now we'll come down here to Leslie Sage. Uh, this, uh, I'm Leslie Sage from Nature, and this is for um, Elizabeth. 
It's an extension of um, Rick's question. What specific physics is there in your model that allows the cores to avoid being ablated or tidally sheared apart? Um, are you talking about the core that... Um, the core for the hot Jupiter. I'm sorry for all of the technical issues. Um, and thank you so much for the follow. Follows are greatly appreciated. They seem to be starting to have significant internet issues coming out of Seattle. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, I'm not entirely sure I understand your question. Okay, so you have a planet at 10 stellar radii. And um, the, the core is going to be subject to severe radiation and tidal shear. How, how can you actually get a core to form under those conditions? Uh, well, it is possible that um, what our scenario is referring to involves migration of the super Earth toward the inner region. Um, we still kind of categorize that as being in situ formation because, um, I mean, the vast majority of the mass would have been accreted in, in situ. Um, but we remain agnostic as to the origin of the cores in uh, that study. So that is definitely a, a topic that should get some future work. Okay, I think we have at least one question online. All right, this question comes from Megan Bartels at space.com, and this question is for Carol. Could you mention one or two potential explanations you considered and why they didn't work out? Okay, uh, well, we considered um, whether we were looking at um, uh, the interaction of a planet at several tens of AU uh, with our features. And um, basically, we have not seen maintained over time a preferred geometry would su which would suggest that we are tracking a planet at large distances. Uh, we also considered, um, oh, I mean, there were so many mechanisms. Uh, well, you mentioned that they're consistent with the size of coronal mass ejections. Yeah, I mean, that's... What about coronal mass ejections? Or well, that's what, what we have to do then, okay. is show you have a coronal mass ejection in the right energy range, and then at the appropriate time later, you see something trek trekking out. Um, this requires uh, not quite coordinated x-ray and uh, other data, and logistically, it is challenging. I mean, we thought when we got a week of XMM time that we died and gone to heaven, um, because then, um, we had a much better chance to get the flare frequency distribution and be able to say how frequent are these things. I mean, tax like to know little things like that <laughs> before they're going to give you a chunk of observing time. And um, so some of this is just, it's logistically difficult to organize an effort and it is, um, and, and the other factor that we were fighting was that uh, Chandra and XMM both observed AUMIC um, about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, Chandra saw no flares. 50 kiloseconds, no flares. Um, XMM saw six. So going from that to uh, this thing is producing coronal mass ejections with the right frequency to be consistent with the stuff that we see heading out, uh, is um, that is one of the things that we are hoping to solve from our current program once we have uh, the flare frequency distribution. So some of this stuff just takes a little more time uh, to, to sort out. And we got all of our XMM and other data in October. Another question? Okay. Um, this question comes from both Monica Young at Sky and Telescope and um, Pamela Gay at Astronomy Cast. So in terms of these hot Jupiters, again, 
Um, we've seen evidence of uh, exoplanets evaporating away. So if these hot Jupiters form in situ, what's to stop them from evaporating away before we can see them? Or is it possible that we're only seeing super young stellar systems? Okay, thanks. Um, so for the case of, uh, I don't know if you remember the desert that I showed in that picture, but the boundary of the desert with the sort of super Earth mass planets is thought to be shaped by photo evaporation. However, hot Jupiters are so massive that they only lose like maybe 1% of their mass over their lifetimes due to photo evaporation. Uh, so uh, photo evaporation doesn't uh, significantly change the, the mass of hot Jupiters or ablate them away once they get to that size. Okay, Are there, I, I've got time for one more. We'll take one more from the back here. Hi, uh, this is James Lowenthal from Smith College in Massachusetts uh, for uh, Elizabeth Bailey. Uh, I know that uh, recent uh, images from ALMA show beautiful, smooth protoplanetary disks, nice and clean, but what role could turbulence and inhomogeneity play in the inner disks that might help hot Jupiters survive? Uh, that might help them survive? Uh, grow and, oh, and grow. Survive. Well, turbulence is thought to be implicated in the specifics uh, underlying um, the disk accretion. Um, disk accretion, um, viscous accretion rates tend to be about 10 to the minus 8 solar masses per year from observations, um, although there is a spread in, in, that, in those observations, about an order of magnitude in each direction. So um, anything that impacts the rate of disk accretion will uh, affect the specifics of this picture. Okay, that's all we have time for. Thank you all very much. A uh, few quick announcements for uh, the press registrants. Uh, reminder that at 11.45 in this room, we'll have a media availability with uh, representatives from the 30-meter telescope project to talk about uh, what to anticipate as they uh, restart or attempt to restart construction of the telescope on Mauna Kea. Uh, there will be a press reception again this evening. Uh, this one will be hosted uh, by the Chandra X-ray Center, and we'll have an opportunity to uh, hear from uh, the director of the Chandra mission right now, uh, Belinda Wilkes. And then, so that's at 5.30 in this room. And then uh, if you haven't signed up for the press dinner on Thursday evening, uh, please go to the link in the press kit and do that. Uh, and the same applies to the tour of LIGO Hanford on Friday. If you uh, want to attend, uh, please sign up for that. Um, I'd like to have that, that list complete by tomorrow so I know how big a van I need to rent. Um, we have a press conference this afternoon at 2.15 Pacific. Um, it's uh, about the Energizer Bunny of sky surveys. Oops, whatever. It's the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, how it keeps going and going, and we're going to hear some of the most recent results from that project. Um, again, uh, we'll have uh, briefings at uh, in the morning and the afternoon, both of the next two days as well. Mistakes were made. I don't know what just happened, but mistakes were made. <sighs> okay, so that concludes our coverage of today's morning press conference from the 233rd meeting of the American Astronomical Society coming to us out of Seattle, Washington. We will be returning later today to bring you an update from our own Annie Wilson, who is on site at the AAS meeting. That will be at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, that is 9 p.m. London. There is a second press conference which will be taking place later this afternoon. And uh, that will be at 5.15 p.m. Eastern, 2.15 Pacific, which is 10.15 UT. We're going to do everything we can to bring you all the science as close to live as we can, and we will be here to answer your questions. So please come back if you're new, give us a follow, and find out whenever we go live. As always, CosmoQuest is brought to you as a production of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. We are supported by you. 
every bit really matters and your subscriptions both here and through patreon.com slash X allow us to keep bringing you the information. Thank you so much for the bits, Veronica. Thank you so much, everyone who is here. Now, um, I am going to go get some lunch and more importantly, I'm going to go turn on the heat because it's getting cold in here. So before you can start seeing my voice, I'm going to do something to fix the temperature. Thank you so much, Trekker Kev, for the bits. Um, I will be back in a few hours and I will be bringing you more science. Have questions? Thank you so much, Sleeper Side, for the donation. Um, have more questions, have more things you want to find out, join us over on Discord. Our DMs are always open. So that ends this stream for now, but it doesn't end it for today. Um, so I am going to, I think that Sky, Skylius is still streaming. Let me double check. I will run the credits and then I will raid another educational streamer. As you raid, please, please give them a warm rocket welcome. And as always, be kind. Wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon, and I will see you later. Mm -hmm.